Hello, for our video today, we are looking at this idea of enzyme inhibition, and we're going to look at something called competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition. Now, just as a quick recap, you'll remember from the previous two videos uh, that I've done, is that we have we can have a substrate that is converted into a product by the action of a biological catalyst called an enzyme. And every enzyme is specific to one particular kind of substrate. One example would be the breakdown of maltose into alpha glucose by the action of maltase. And if we look at that diagrammatically, here's our enzyme molecule, here's our maltose, and we can see that the maltose, the substrate, can fit into the active site of the enzyme. We did mention that there is an alternative model for the way this works that was that was really the lock and key model for enzyme action we did mention that there is another way in which the active site is not exactly complementary uh, but when the enzyme sorry when the substrate molecule comes along the active site changes shape slightly to accommodate the substrate but i'm going to keep to the lock and key model just to keep it simple for today's video okay so you can imagine then the uh, substrate fits into the active site. We have our enzyme substrate complex. We then have our enzyme product complex. And these are the products that are made as a result of this reaction. And the product, as we said, is alpha glucose. OK, so this is just a, a quick recap and overview of what we've done already. There is more details, as I say, in two previous videos. So what we're going to look at first is this idea of competitive inhibition. So let's use the same example as we did before. Here I've got a conical flask and imagine that that reaction that we just talked about is happily proceeding inside there. We've got our substrate, which is our maltose, and our enzyme, uh, which is maltase. Now sometimes we have present uh, with these reactions another molecule that we would call an inhibitor. And the reason why this is an inhibitor is because it slows the rate of the reaction that's going on inside this flask. This particular example is a competitive in competitive inhibitor. And the reason why we call it competitive is because if you look at the shape of this particular molecule, part of its shape actually is complementary also to the active site. In actual fact, we don't really say it's complementary. We say it's very similar to the shape of the active site. Because it's so similar, it can also occupy the active site. So at any one time, either the substrate molecule can fit into the active site or the inhibitor molecule can. And again, we say it's competitive because they both compete for the active site. So what happens then in this reaction? Well, we've got our substrate we have our enzyme and we have our competitive inhibitor. At any one point, either the inhibitor can be in the active site or the substrate can. And that means the whole reaction is going to be slowed down because the substrate won't necessarily be able to get into the active site at any point. And this will slow down the rate of the reaction. We could reduce the influence or reduce the impact of the competitive inhibitor by increasing the concentration of substrate. So here we now have in the same volume much more substrate and you can see because there's much more the likelihood of the substrate molecule fitting into the active site is higher is higher than with the inhibitor simply because there are more substrate molecules there. So how would we show this in a graph? Well this is how the graph looks without any inhibitor present so this is no competitive inhibitor. As the substrate concentration rises, so does the rate of reaction up until a point where the rate of reaction is maximum. Um, but if we add our inhibitor, our competitive inhibitor, the shape of the graph changes. So here we have with inhibitor Tor. And you can see that at any one point along the initial part of the graph, the, re the reaction with the inhibitor is slower than the reaction without the inhibitor. And that is simply because we have competition to occupy the active site. But as we increase the substrate concentration, 
the effect of the inhibitor is reduced and actually at this point here we've got such a high concentration of substrate um, that the inhibitor is not getting a chance actually to compete with the substrate to get into the active site. So eventually we do reach the same rate of reaction as we did without our inhibitor but it's a slower build up to that point there. The next thing we're looking at is non-competitive inhibition and this works slightly differently. So imagine again we have our enzyme, here's reaction going on in a flask. We have our enzyme, we have our substrate and this can happily um, work in the way that we've just discussed but sometimes we can have molecules that are present that are not competitive inhibitors but non-competitive inhibitors. They still inhibit but they don't compete for the active site so this molecule can fit into this site, the part of the enzyme, let's make that a bit bigger, a part of the enzyme that's not the active site and once it does that it actually changes the shape of the active site so our substrate can no longer fit in. They're not competing, the inhibitor is not competing for the active site yet it manages to change the active site by attaching to a site on the enzyme other than the active site and changing the shape of the active site. So how does this look in our uh, example like we did before. Here we have our substrate, here we have our enzyme and you can see this substrate can fit into this enzyme but this substrate molecule cannot fit into this enzyme molecule there. Now this is not a result of competitive inhibition so it doesn't matter um, if we increase the concentration of our substrate so much because these molecules here they're not competing for the active site. So once we increase the substrate concentration, much more substrate there, even though we've got more substrate, because there's no competition, these molecules can stop the action of an enzyme momentarily, simply because they're acting at another site. So how would the graph look? Again, this is without our uh, non-competitive inhibitor, but if we added our competitive inhibitor, we would get a graph that looks like this. There would be an increase in the rate of reaction, once we increase the substrate concentration but it would max out at a lower point so this is with our non non competitive inhibitor so it's important that you understand these graphs and you can tell the difference between uh, the two types of inhibition and how the graph looks the non competitive inhibitor will level out at a lower uh, point and the competitive one will level out at the same point but it will take longer getting there and you should be able to explain why in terms of these molecules and the way they interact with each other. Now the next thing I want to go through is um, just to have a look at an example of this in a what you might see in an exam question or an actual, actual application of this. So what I've got here is a uh, example of an enzyme controlled reaction. We've got a substance called xanthine and this is converted into something called uric acid and that's done by the action of the enzyme called xanthine oxidase and uric acid is something in the body that's produced in the body by this reaction that can cause this uh, rather painful problem called gout. Now we've got our xanthine here but we also have a treatment that's called allopurinol and allopurinol has a molecular shape which I'll show you now. So if you look at these two molecules uh, you can see um, on the surface of it they might, might not look similar but if you actually look this is made of a six ring and a five ring structure and this one also is made of a six ring and a five ring structure so the shapes are very similar it's very important that when you talk about inhibitors uh, competitive inhibitors that you're talking about the fact that the shape is similar to the substrate, not the same as the substrate but similar to the substrate um, and not the same as the enzyme. Now if you look at these two shapes they are quite similar barring a few atoms that are off the sides and so on but the shapes are similar. So how does this work? How does allopurinol, allopurinol work as a treatment? So there's the question there. Suggest so how allopurinol helps to treat gout. Well the first point you would make is that it's a competitive inhibitor. It has to, you have to say competitive because the shapes are similar. Uh, you could get away with saying non-competitive and show that you understand this idea of inhibition, but I think they're kind of get to, getting towards this idea that they're a similar shape. So you say that, that again, the, sh the shape is similar, 
to xanthine it enters the active site uh, i.e. the allopurinol enters the active site and therefore there is less uric acid produced now it's important that you say that, that you don't say that there's no um, uric acid produced because the inhibitor actually slows the rate of the reaction doesn't stop the rate of the reaction so you say that there is less uric acid produced that's very important to emphasize that okay so this is an example that you might see as an application for non for sorry for enzyme inhibition there is one more I want to quickly go through and this is the idea of metabolic pathways so here we have a metabolic pathway we've got a substrate which is converted via a series of conversions to our end product. It's not just a single step substrate to product, it's a multi-step uh, pathway. We call this a metabolic pathway. So what we have is a series of intermediate steps in order to make our final end product. So substrate, the initial substrate here in blue is converted into substance A, which is converted into substance B, both with capitals, and finally our end product. These are these steps are controlled by enzymes. So our lowercase a there is enzyme A, which controls the conversion of substrate of the substrate into substance capital A, and B and C, as you can see there. Okay, so we have our final end product, which is the substance that we need. Now often we don't want the end product to be in too high levels or too low levels otherwise the cell can't uh, function properly so what we do is we have a system called end product inhibition and the way it works is like this so let's imagine our end product is a substance that has that particular shape the molecule has this particular shape in our example and we have our initial enzyme which works like this so here's our substrate that we're starting off with enzyme A in green converts this uh, substrate into substance A so we can see as we've studied the substrate fits into the active site and it can be then uh, converted now you can also see here that we have another site on the enzyme and our substrate can fit into that site and what can happen is our end product can fit into a site other than the active site but as you can see here it's actually changed the shape of the active site so this substrate can no longer fit into the active site and that enzyme cannot work now this is actually using uh, non-competitive inhibition in order to slow down the production of substance A from our substrate and if substance A is slowed down that means substance B is going to be slowed down because there's less of substance A present and so on and so on so we get less of our end product once we get less of our end product we're going to have less non-competitive inhibition of our enzyme and then that means the enzyme can work a little bit more quickly again and our end product uh, is then produced at a faster rate again and in the vast majority of cases end product inhibition happens as a result of non-competitive inhibition the product will fit into a site in the enzyme other than the active site so it's not competing for the active site it will change the shape of the active site and reduce the uh, rate of the overall reaction as we've just described so that's an overview of competitive and non-competitive inhibition, a couple of uh, applications of the uh, idea. And other than that, that's me done for today's video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon.